So Dr. Leon Schreiber is the head of strategic comms at the Democratic Alliance. And Leon, you've been on the show a number of times. And you know, Keter deployment is your bugbear. You have finally managed to get the minutes of the Keter deployment committee meetings. I, do you feel vindicated? Yeah, good good day, Ramon and Byron. Good to be here again. Um, yes, I suppose it's it is a, it is a kind of vindication, but it's a sad vindication of things that we all suspected. I think uh, at, to be at the root of the state that South Africa finds itself in. So. Um, I think that a lot of us have accepted for a long time that it is a fact that the ANC interferes with appointment processes across the state. And most recently, you would have seen that at Transnet, the current CEO, uh, the finalization of that appointment is being held up by the deployment committee. So we know these things happen, but it is it is quite a thing to see it in sort of granular detail that now includes even WhatsApp discussions. I mean, there's a cater deployment WhatsApp group that says, um, you know, we've got this vacancy coming up. Can you put forward some cadres? Um, or that says, you know, this list of people that, that the minister wants to appoint is unacceptable. Um, so I think the depth of this is, is quite astounding. It's 1,300 pages. But here's the thing that, is, that I think drives home just how extensive cater deployment actually is. And that is that, you know, we asked for records dating back to 2013. But now that we've worked through it, this only dates back to 2018. And we will be announcing additional steps tomorrow because of this. But the bottom line is we're sitting here with 1,300 pages of documents that are heavily censored by the ANC um, and that only go back, you know, a, a part of the period that we're looking for. But even there, we can see interference in the courts. We can see interference in nominally independent institutions like the independent a nuclear regulator, for example. That's surely the kind of thing we don't want to see in these minutes. Um, and across every, you know, government department and state-owned enterprise. So the first, the first question I've got from myself is, why did you specifically spearhead this campaign? Obviously, you've run it. You've been in the news. You, you, you personally have been should we say the figurehead of the campaign for the Cato deployment committees? Well, I personally feel very strongly about this. I think that that's actually where the answer starts. Um, when I entered politics in 2019, this was one of the real motivations for me to do so. Um, previously, I, Ramon and I actually um, spoke before I went into politics. And, and you will remember that I previously worked as a researcher in the U.S., and I did my PhD in political science also, focusing very much on this topic of how do you actually build a state that can deliver, and especially in poorer countries. So I was very privileged to travel to um, different parts of the world and actually see examples like Rwanda, for example, where you have you know, the ability to collect taxes and actually you know, give people property rights after a genocide. Um, also a country like Vietnam, I mean, a communist state, but one that is almost cowboy capitalist in how it operates, and also able to actually build a well-functioning civil service. Um, so this is something that I'm very passionate about. And when I got into Parliament in 2019, I remember very clearly a meeting with the then Chief Whip, John Stiernazen, to ask basically, you know, if no one else wants this portfolio of public service and administration, I would really like it because I think I can do something meaningful um, that gets us to address some of the root causes of state failure in South Africa. And, you know, during this period since 2019, we've obviously had the Zondo Commission making findings, vindicating what the DA has been saying for decades about cater deployment. Uh, we've had now, you know, various court cases I introduced an end cater deployment bill in Parliament that was supported by every opposition party. It was only the ANC that actually stood against it. It was quite a remarkable thing as well. Um, so I am proud that over the past five years, the DA has done a lot of work to not only put this on the agenda, but to also actually really start turning the tide against cater deployment in the public narrative. And I think that what's coming out now, even if I look at news reports again from this morning, uh, it is very clear that South Africans get it. They understand that the reason they don't have electricity, the reason their taps are running dry, the reason they, you know, the trains no longer run is because cadres who cannot do the job 
and who were put there on the basis of loyalty to the ANC have destroyed every part of the state. Um, for me, the bottom line is very simple. If we had a couple of in isolated institutions that are not working, then we could have talked about, you know, what's wrong at those institutions. But what we have clearly is a systemic state failure across the board. And that means that there's a systemic cause. And cadre deployment is that cause. And I'm very proud of the work that the DA is doing to fight back against that and, and try and slow down and then ultimately turn around what we're seeing in the state. Okay, and uh, I think that's a, a very worthwhile ambition that you're pursuing. The, the, the first, let's call it, the, let's get into the real nitty gritty. You're not going to get a deployment record. Um, I suppose they're, they're, this is two parts. So forgive me, I'm going to ask you two questions at once. The, the first is, uh, sure. unsurprising, the records are redacted. They're heavily, as you said, heavily censored. Uh, zero surprise there. Um, but more importantly, they seem to gloss over the period of, as you very rightly said, 2013 to 2018, which is what we would typically refer to now as the state capture period, where Sir Ramaphosa was the head of the Cater Deployment Committee. Th this is going to be deliberate, right? I mean, obviously, Ramaphosa came to power in 2018 on the New Dawn agenda. He's going to clean up corruption in the state. We've now seen corruption actually go into to overdrive under his watch, not be cleaned up. I mean, for example, we've only ever seen the step aside rule used once. Where's Mogashule? No, no one else. It's literally his rule. It's the rule for him. And everybody in his cabinet now, I think they're saying in the number of people who fingered in the Zonda report is just under a thousand people, which means that basically you'd have to fire, well, everyone. They'd all have to step, step aside. But is it not you, you guys must have been expecting that, right? You must have been expecting that the cater deployment records would be censored in order to protect Ramaphosa's role in what's gone on. Yes, but I think how brazen they've been um, just shows you that the ANC really is shameless. So um, the, the the matter of records dating back earlier than 2018 was very deliberate in our application before the court. We wanted the minutes and the, and, the, and the documents going back to the 1st of January 2013, because as you say, that is when Ramaphosa became the chairman of the deployment committee. So all of these people, the Slaudi Motsunengs, the Brian Mulefes, the Dudu Mienis, they all passed through the deployment committee, of which he was the chairman. And then a few years later, he sits in front of the State Capture Commission and claims to not know how the state was captured and he had nothing to do with it. And it is crystal clear now from the records we have, seeing how the deployment committee operates, it is a massive syndicate. It is a racketeering syndicate with a very intricate process of actually ensuring that vacancies and positions are in fact discussed and influenced through the deployment committee across the state. So there is no way that Ramaphosa could not have known and not have been personally involved, chairing meetings where these people who captured the state were so-called deployed. But I think what is really brazen on the ANC's part is that they not only didn't provide minutes from prior to 2018, but they also want us to believe that WhatsApp wasn't invented in 2018. The emails that they've made available to us suddenly only started in 2018. Um, so they have tried very hard to wipe Ramaphosa's fingerprints off of CADA deployment. They've done so by by ignoring essentially half of our request for things to go back to 2013. And as you say then, additionally, also censoring the things that they did make available to us. Now, the big problem for the ANC, of course, is the court order was very clear that the full request submitted by the DA must be adhered to. There was no reference in our request to things being redacted for any reason. And even more importantly, Throughout three years of battling the ANC in court on this, they never once raised any issue about a need for redaction or, or why it must be justified in any particular case. So in other words, the court's order was actually very clear that these are the full records that must be made available, and we believe they are in contravention of that court order. And that is why I'm saying 
we will uh, be announcing more action on this. We will not leave this issue here because if you look at some of these things and you just see how they've been scratched out, I mean, it's quite reminiscent, frankly, of a Watergate type scandal uh, where, you know, there are recordings that go missing that happen to be the recordings where the president was speaking. Um, and so we are going to actually be tackling it with the same kind of approach that you would need in that kind of uh, situation, because this is really now withholding critical information from South Africans in contravention of a court order. So, Leon, yeah, I managed to, to, to see some of them. Obviously, if the information got out into the public domain, it would actually look very bad for the ruling party. But that in itself is actually the question. Yeah. I know many people in our audience are going to ask the fundamental question, and that question is, so what? Okay, so okay, the deployment committee's out. We understand that Cyril was, was actually responsible for the state capture. Ramon and I have a theory, and that theory is, regrettably, that Zuma was actually a patsy. Uh, the actual theory is that during his period of presidency, he obviously had Ramaphosa there. Ramaphosa was the one basically doing a lot of the work. Zuma kind of went around, did his stuff. We're not saying he's innocent. We're certainly not saying he's innocent. But the way that Zuma was painted during the Zondo Commission was, no, it's all his fault. And I think that the Cater Deployment Committee may show that it isn't actually true. But the question that everybody's going to ask is, let's say our theory, and it's just a theory, it's mine and Ramon's, let's say our theory is true. So what? Now what? Okay, so you've proved that the Cater Deployment Committee is responsible for the collapse of the state. You've proved that it is a giant racketeering. You've proved that it is a giant mafia. The majority of the ANC's voters don't read News 24. They don't watch YouTube. They don't listen to our podcasts. They don't care. What they care about is their 350 grant, which they're still getting. So do they care? I mean, so now what? what, what what's the consequence of it? Yeah, so I think the first point about an attempt to paint state capture as as solely due to one individual um, was extremely dishonest and has been exposed through through these minutes and records coming out. Um, because, as I say, you, you need an entire system to do to the state what the ANC has done to it. It's not a kind of isolated one-man show. Um, you need a mechanism to actually capture the state. And CADA deployment is that mechanism. No, but, and Ramaphosa but we have the seen of, of that mechanism. But we have seen the, the role of Jesse Duarte, yeah, who yeah. we all know is, you know, the devil's play toy. So, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that in the sixth circle of hell, she, she's there somewhere. Well, yes, I mean, uh, of course, she's now not here to speak for herself. So I think, um, you know, that is a pity. But we have seen, as you say, you know, letters from her to the justice minister saying that, you know, the, the, the role and power and influence of the Chief Justice of South Africa really must be urgently addressed because we need more cadres on the Constitutional Court. That's basically the gist of, of her objection. Um, so, yes, but I mean, again, it's, 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 not, it's not only one person. It is um, a really systemic thing where the, the, the NEC nominates these people and then they go and capture the state for that particular five-year period. I think that's really the point. You, you said earlier, Byron, that we talk about the period of state capture. State capture is an ongoing project. It will exist for as long as the ANC is able to manipulate appointments, to put people that are loyalists into those positions. For, for, for as long as that happens, we, the state will be captured by the ANC, by a particular political party. But I want to get to your point about so what? I think it is a very important question because, you know, ultimately we do have to <clears throat> start moving in a better direction. And I think there are a couple of parts to, to the so what. The first one is, of course, the legal part. Um, it is in many ways the less ideal way to tackle this kind of thing. But, you know, it is something that we are pursuing very aggressively. So you would have seen the judgment yesterday from the Pretoria High Court that did not rule in our favor that cater deployment is unconstitutional. Uh, we respect that ruling, of course, but we, we vehemently disagree with it. And we are convinced a, a higher court will come to a different conclusion. So we will be using, obviously, everything that we have as we appeal and continue to make this case that it is actually a contravention of the Constitution. Uh, so that is a process that's running. And as we know, the ANC will likely delay and we can sit here probably years from now still talking about it. That's the unfortunate reality of these court processes. Not that they're unimportant, but but we will obviously take a long time to go through that. 
I think the bigger point, and in the more sort of societal sense, I do believe that there are more people now who understand that if you want to actually move away from a captured state that is collapsing everything around you, then you have to actually get away from the ANC. And these records are definitely reaching more people with the message that this is not a one-man show, as you said. This is not something that happened by accident. It is actually fundamentally because of the ANC. It is part of the way of operating that has, that has collapsed everything around you um, and why you are struggling to find a job and, and other things like that. So I wouldn't say that that doesn't read, reach anyone. I do think that this is permeating. I can say to you, for example, um, I've gotten feedback um, one example comes to mind from a community activist in Bushbrook Ridge who, who actually says, you know, um, this has been really inspiring to see that you can take on this fight because at the ground level, people are locked out from EPWP work opportunities, for example, because of cater deployment. You know, you'll, you'll have an ANC ward councillor who dishes out these state jobs to caters and to, and to party loyalists. Um, and anyone in a local municipality who challenges some of these practices um, are, are really, you know, attacked. So I do think that there are people across the board who understand this now. But then at the same time, there's also, of course, an election coming up. And that is why we said yesterday that if you actually look at the court's ruling yesterday, they threw it back to the people. In other words, the court is not touching it right now. And we, on the 29th of May, have an opportunity to actually say whether we want to continue with this or not. And obviously for that to happen, we need more people who have previously not voted for the DA or not voted against the ANC to come out and do that. And your point about grants is an important one, Byron, because we said very clearly at our manifesto launch that things like cater deployment, like corruption, is stealing money at such a rate that eventually the money is going to run out for grants. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand. If you look at the budget yesterday, the fact that we have to now dip into our gold and foreign currency reserves to essentially bail out the treasury, it demonstrates to you that South Africa is rapidly running out of money. And so we are taking that message that the ANC's corruption, its cater deployment is a threat to grants. We are taking that message to the ground so that people actually understand it's ironic when the ANC says that your grant will go away if the ANC loses power. The truth is the grant will become totally unfundable if the ANC retains power because of its corruption. And so these are some of the messages that we are taking out there. And we will be making the case for why, if you want to actually pre prevent the you know, full-scale, complete collapse of the South African state, including things like grants that people care about, that you actually have to come out and vote against the ANC and vote for the DA. Yeah, I think it's, uh, the whole thing is very interesting, though, because right. obviously you're taking it to the courts and you're going through... Hold on, the Byron, hold on. Let's actually focus on I'm that. I'm just going to change even my, my Wi-Fi. I apologize. One We've second. recently seen in some of the the uh, judicial... Byron, appointment wait for me, boards, please. Just so everybody knows, this is a board. They debate basically who's going to be appointed to key positions in the judiciary, and the board itself is staffed by, well, politicians, to be frank. And we've recently seen in the news that uh, some of the min ministers that have come out of there gives an example of Julius Malima specifically targeting Holter Holter on the basis of subtle racism, basically just because you don't want YT appointed to the board. So that's an example of where that board is basically taking a legal mind that's deemed to be very smart and they're not actually appointing him. Um, and that's become a very interesting example because, as you very rightly point out, there's an example of Jesse Duarte doing that with the Chief Justice. So we can see that the politicians themselves are attempting to capture the senior courts. But in terms of the actual capture of the courts, that appears like it's occurred very, should we say, systematically when it comes through to the lower courts. We, we certainly hear cries of racism and ANC talking points much more in the lower courts than we do in the higher courts. But I mean, it's only a matter of time before that kind of switches. So from your perspective, obviously, when you got the judgment yesterday around cater deployment, basically saying, well, the ANC shouldn't interfere with the state overtly, but it can influence the appointments of people. In other words, they can just say, well, our preference is this. But that's actually not what we're seeing in the cater deployment committees, are we? What we're actually seeing is that they're, they're out there specifically saying, 
our preference is this, your preference is that, you should really listen to us and do what we say. And you can't even appoint your guy until yeah. we've looked at it, which is what you're seeing specifically. Yeah. So you didn't have that evidence when you lodged your initial appeal to indicate the deployment. You now have that evidence and you're going to appeal the judgment. But the point that I, I wanted to get to is actually the ANC's response to that judgment. And I think that response from their, their, their spokesperson was actually quite telling. Because in order to understand the response, we have to first go back to the Zonin Commission where Ramaphosa was asked about Cater Deployment Committee and he basically said it doesn't exist. We don't have a Cater Deployment Policy. And then Gordon Matasha came out and basically said, we do have a Cater Deployment Policy and it's a good thing. And then a lot of the other, they went off to, you know, Fakili and Balula and he came out and he said, well, we do, but we don't, you know, we only just say who we like. So everybody kind of came out with their own impression of it. And yet yesterday, after that judgment, the ANC's official spokesperson said, not only do we have a catered deployment policy, but we're now emboldened mm. by that decision because it shows that our mm. catered deployment policy is great. It's fine. So what, what do you take from that? Because I take from that that the ANC is basically going to do catered deployment on steroids now. Yeah, I, so I just want to say you, you mentioned how the, the committee works and how it forces people to comply with it. But there's actually another step, which is that they actually discipline people if you don't comply. And that is such a critical point in our entire argument because, you know, how could something possibly be voluntary if you lose your job or you get sanctioned for not complying? I mean, that really sets their whole argument on fire that it's, you know, some kind of benign uh, entity. Um, but yes, I mean, I think you're... you're assessment is right. The ANC probably yesterday said what they really think. And that is, you know, essentially don't worry what anyone says. We will continue with this come hello high water. Um, and frankly, that's not the first time they've said it. Uh, just at, at the Sona debate a week or two ago, uh, Gwede Mantashe got up and said, okay, you, you know, you're winning court cases and you'll get your records, but we will continue deploying cadres. And I think, you know, the fact that we've had the State Capture Commission where Judge Zondo said it is unconstitutional for anyone to take into account the views of a political party's committee, and where he confirmed that Cato deployment laid the foundation for state capture, that we still have a president, ANC officials, all of whom continue to defend Cato deployment. And that just tells us all that the ANC is not going to let this go unless we force them to. So in a way, I mean, as... as um, I suppose depressing as it is to confront the reality that the ANC has absolutely no interest in bringing an end to state capture and corruption and collapsing service delivery, that actually does vindicate the um, energy that the DA is putting into this fight and that we have been sort of escalating over the past couple of years. So in a, in a way, I think yesterday's ruling was, was fuel to the fire for our work in this regard. And that we actually now need to go and even more urgently intensify both our political and our legal work against cater deployment. Because, you know, I, they have said to us very clearly now that they will not um, bring an end to this. So we have to do it for them. And if that takes, you know, a constitutional court ruling, then that's what we'll do. If it takes the ANC losing massively at the election and, you know, then being forced to capitulate on some of these things, then that's what we'll have to do. Um, but the bottom line just is, Byron, uh, you know, just sitting back and accepting that, oh, they'll just keep doing it forever is not an option because then we really have no, there is no prospect of recovery. Uh, if we allow the same system that destroyed the state to stay in place, it will make it impossible to ever restore and rescue the state. So, uh, you know, this is what it is. Um, it is politics. It is an environment where the ANC thinks that they are, un, you know, uh, uh, unbeatable and they'll always be in power and we're just going to have to teach them a very hard lesson at the end of this road so from my side i can only say it's fuel to the fire uh, to for our work and our determination and that's why i'm saying we will be announcing uh, some additional steps shortly that i think will um you know intensify the anc's worry that the public is turning against them on this issue well the public is turning against them but you know again I suppose it's important to also to identify, especially with our audience and, you know, to, to be honest, everyone, 
This is part of the ANC's agenda. You know, ANC specifically has a national democratic revolution at us. The core of its party's idea, what it actually wants is to capture the states in order to have a one-party state. They want to have a socialist slash communist utopia where they rule until Jesus comes back. Zuma told you himself, himself, like, if a guy tells you who he is, you should probably believe him. Same as Ramaphosa, he says he's a socialist. You should probably believe him when he tells you that. So this is all part of the, the capture of the states in order to control the states. But it looks like the, the, the control of the state for the ANC is, is nearing absolute. And your judgment yesterday with the high courts is, is almost an example of that. So it's, it's great that you're, you're exposing the rot. You know, we give you Godspeed. Going to ask you a question. I know you, you, you're going to, you're going to say what I kind of think you're going to say anyway. Who's winning the election in May? Oh, who's winning the election? Yeah, who's winning the election in May? Well, the great thing, Byron, is uh, in May's election, we're going to have a very different definition of what winning means. I think this is actually a very important question. It's not as straightforward because we are used to having one dominant party where winning means 50% plus one. But if you actually look at our electoral system, and you know, in 2018, I published a book called Coalition Country that did exactly this. It's exceedingly rare for proportional systems like ours at a national level. Yes, at a regional level and in provinces, it makes sense that you can have outright majorities. But at a national level, you very rarely have outright majorities with our proportional system if you look at other countries that actually have the same system. So that's a long way of saying that you know, the ANC is going to lose the election because in their minds, winning means 50% plus one, and they're not going to get that. They are going to have a cataclysmically bad election, and they are definitely going to lose. The question of the winner then becomes, I think, which party can actually grow and establish itself at, at the heart of a new coalition government. That's going to be what winning looks like. And it will obviously then not be only one party, you may have a multi-party government, but the DA is certainly uh, very well positioned to win the election in the sense of becoming the anchor tenant for a new multi-party government. So we're going to have to get used to this question being more complicated than we always traditionally thought, because it's not going to be a case of 50% plus one for a national government for the foreseeable future. Once the ANC's majority is gone, you know, we will have to continue steadily building towards that. But uh, we're going to have multi-party governments. And I do think in that environment, once we understand that that's how things are going to look after the election, the DA is going to emerge as the winner because we're going to be one of the few established parties that actually end up growing. And that's going to position us, along with the multi-party charter, to actually form a multi-party government with the DA really playing this role and taking this responsibility serious of being the anchor that brings stability to, to that kind of scenario. Um, so I'm very optimistic. I, I think that everything that's going on, I mean, just think about the fact that the ANC is two days out from its manifesto launch, which traditionally is a big event for them. Uh, but all that's happening is that everyone talks about cater deployment and their corruption and how they try to attack the judiciary and all these things. I mean, there is, there is a lot going on in our politics that makes it very possible we, that we may emerge from the election with the ANC as the big loser because their majority is gone and the DA as the big winner because we position ourselves to really become the anchor party in a new multi-party government and bring our experience, bring our track record uh, into that government and, and, and hopefully start turning South Africa around. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, uh, I, you know, final point for me is the biggest fear for everybody, including myself, I suppose, is actually an ANC, EFF, uh, possibly even a PA, ANC, EFF, PA coalition type thing that goes out there and basically accelerates the decay of the state. As you know, that's everybody's fear at the moment, um, possibly even MK now, because MK is elected to pick up possibly anywhere yeah. between 8 and 10%. So it does sound like the ANC has kind of played that proxy a little bit well so that it can, if it has to go into coalition, it kind of has coalition partners with what the ANC describes as 
ideological similarities. You know, it's a nice word basically saying they believe the same rubbish as we do. Um, some analysts say they're not sure that the ANC and the EFF would partner because they both play in the same pool. Might be a little bit dangerous for them. They say the same thing for, for MK. Possibly MK has a chip on his shoulder and wouldn't really want to play the ANC. What's your view? You think we, what, what's, that, what's the possibility of uh, ANC, EFF, MK coalition of corruption? Yeah. And if that does happen, Look, how I, bad I, would it be for the rest of us? Yeah. yeah. I think that that is a very genuine fear and, and people should take it seriously. But I would say in that environment, we, we have to then also, if that's what ends up happening, we need to have the strongest possible bulwark against that uh, coalition. Because my, uh, my point of departure is never, and I don't think it can ever be in South Africa, that, you know, yes, bad things have happened and now we're defeated and we, you know, we must just basically, we can't do anything. We always have to try and do something. And even in this absolute worst case scenario, which I would say, I would remind uh, the, the viewers, is John Steenhuisen was the first person to warn about this. At our Congress last year in April, he said that a doomsday coalition between the ANC and the EFF would be actually the worst possible scenario for South Africa. And as you will remember, a lot of analysts and people at the time were trying to say, oh, but this is, you know, exaggeration. And why is the DA worried about the EFF? As the election approaches, you can see that more and more people realize that this is a real prospect. And if this happens, we really are in very serious trouble and our democracy itself may not survive the idea of Julius Malema in the union buildings. So I think that this must strengthen our resolve that even as we go out and vote to get a new government in, to get the multi-party charter in, to get the DA in as a big anchor tenant for such a new government, we can also hedge, hedge our bets at the same time by making sure that we create the biggest possible bulwark, the strongest possible opposition against that possibility. Obviously, we are playing to win. We do not want to have that situation. And that's why we're asking people to help the multi-party charter get over the 50% mark. Uh, but at the same time, we are also saying, you know, a vote for the DA is actually in this election a win-win proposition. Because if the, if the, if the multi-party charter succeeds, you get a strong, experienced, stable party at the heart of this coalition government so that we don't have the mess that we have in places like Johannesburg. But at the same time, if we do fall short as the charter, you end up then having at least the strongest possible opposition to the ANC, EFF, MK, or whatever that scenario ends up being. And so I think that that's a very uh, compelling argument for why it is a win-win to vote for the DA. However, if that comes, if that scenario does come to pass, we are going to have to be the strongest, most focused, uh, most dedicated opposition that you've ever seen in South Africa, because we are going to have really our hands full. You know, it will make the ANC's time in government look like a cakewalk. But again, I say, really, the DA is the only party that can actually be that bulwark, that can be big enough to go out onto, you know, the ground, but also parliamentary committees to go to court, to challenge Malema, to really, really fight as much as we can against this scenario. So I think it's all to play for uh, in this election. We have a great opportunity to get the multi-party charter across the line with a stable anchor party. And at the same time, you actually have a win-win proposition with the DA vote this time around, because should the worst come to pass, at least you'll have the strongest possible opposition fighting in your corner.